plan for us today. I wanted to take you all out and introduce you to some of the folks who make my farm here so successful. The first stop is at Pascal Diebetter's house to learn how he makes great baled hay. And then it's off to SNS Grain in Arcadia to pick up some chicken feed. Then we'll be stopping by my neighbors, Tom and Steve. And I want to invite them all back to my farm for a farm fresh meal. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. A few years ago, I moved up to Wisconsin. I started an organic dairy farm at St. Isidore's Mead. That's when I discovered the abundance of Midwestern local food and small-scale farmers, growing everything from green zebra tomatoes to pasture pork. I'm taking a break from the cows, hitting the road, and seeing if I can't satisfy my epicurious appetite. Oh. That's crazy. This is amazing. Funding for Around the Farm Table is provided in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, a member-driven organization for family farmers, rural communities, and all people. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. Information at wisconsinfarmersunion.com. With additional support from these community members, and friends of Wisconsin Public Television. I really love having chickens. I've had chickens ever since I was a little girl. When you have chickens, and I think you should, because they're just fantastic to have, you want to make sure that they have really good feed. And that's why I go to SNS Grain to get my nice, uh, diverse mix of feed. One thing that I always make sure that they have too is grit. Now grit is like a little gravel and since the chickens can't, they can't digest that food on their own, they need something in their, their gizzards to break that food down so it grinds the, the grains and then they can digest it. I also have oyster shells that I put into the feed mix because that's a, a lot of calcium it takes to lay an egg. One thing you wanna make sure that you do, especially during the summertime, is make sure you have available cold water for the chickens. That's one way that they can cool themselves down on hot summer days. I also love this chicken coop that I have because it it's a movable chicken coop, so I can move the chickens every day to a fresh piece of grass. Chickens eat a lot of grass. I was really surprised to see just how much grass they really eat. And they love to dig up and, and eat the worms and things like that. That's where I get those really yellow, yellow, orangey yolks in my eggs that I love to bake with and that I'm gonna be using later on today. So one thing I love about this chicken coop too is it's pretty resistant to any pests. When you, when you have chickens, you'll learn that everything loves to eat chicken, whether it's an owl or a fox, or I've had everything uh, come out my chickens. And so I made sure to get a nice sturdy coop this time so I don't have to lose any chickens to predators. All right, well, let's head off to Pascal's. Well, I'm at the Diveter Farm. Pascal and his wife Donna and their kids run an organic dairy farm here. Pascal's been a great help with answering any questions I have about organic dairy farming. And I'm gonna find out a little bit about what he's doing right now. Hey, Pascal. Hello, Inga. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Hey, I went to France this year, this last winter. I heard that. I didn't get to Normandy, but I did go to uh, just around the south of France. So, and that's where you're from. France. Normandy, yes. Normandy, okay. Well, so how long, ha when did you guys immigrate to the United States? Uh, 69. Okay. And what was, why did you, your family come here? Well, to my dad, this was the land of opportunity. Uh-huh. And uh, he did have a uncle that had a farm in Illinois. Oh, okay. So we lived with him for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. And how often do you get back to France just to visit? Oh, every three, four years. Oh, I would, I would go back every year if I had the, if I milked more cows and I could afford it. <laughs> Pascal, what are you looking for in your, your hay? Well, first I, I want it to be young. Mm -hmm. I like uh, 
la lot of leaves, I like full stems, which shows uh, more nutrition in the, rather than a hollow stem. The grasses, I want fine leaves, not no heads. Mm -hmm. uh, less fiber. Yeah. Don't you have to like till under your hay fields like every so often and then? I rotate frequently, so my hay is only stays about two years of production. Oh, wow. Because that, that's my best avenue into a good corn crop is a hay that I can plow down. Mm -hmm. So I have all the nitrogen credits from the legumes and... Okay, huh, nice. And also the wheat suppression. So what's the difference between making hay and making silage? First of all, for hay, we spread it out more so it dries easier. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of course, a forage just goes up at 60% moisture, whereas dry hay is harvested at 15% moisture. Oh, okay. And so you'll just take this and put it right in the silo, or what do you do to it? Yes, we chop it up and put it in the bunker silo. Oh, okay. And do you make, you make some dry hay too, right? Usually we do that second crop, we have more sun. What's the difference between like first, second, third crop uh, cuttings? Quality-wise, it's very similar if it's always cut at the same stage. Typically, some first crop gets cut late, which people Mm -hmm. I assume is uh, lower quality hay, but uh, it can be cut early and being high quality also. All right, well, I'm gonna let you get back to it. Uh, but I was hoping that you would come over for lunch today. I'm gonna have some guys over, all the people that have been helping me out with farming and answering my questions and finding feed for me when I run out and all these kind of wonderful things. I'd like to treat you guys to a lovely lunch. Are you free this afternoon? Yeah, I'd like that. Okay, and if you have any more small bales of straw, I'd like to buy some more. Uh, so if you can bring over, I don't know, 10 or 12, something like that. Yeah, I can bring some. Okay. I, got, I got lots left. All righty. Well, good. Well, have a good rest of the day at work, and I'll see you later. This is why I love Wisconsin. Well, this is the SNS grain. This is where I've been getting my cow feed and my chicken feed for quite a few years. Dan and Bob are excellent guys. Bob was one of the pioneers of organic farming here in the Midwest, and Dan is a wealth of knowledge. And he's also, I call him like my part-time therapist because he's a great listener too. But let's go meet these guys. Hi, Anga. Hey, Bob, how's it going? Good. Good. Hey, Dan. Hello. How are you today? Good. How are you guys doing? You like that motorcycle? I do. It? Hey, it's a great way to travel, I think. <laughs> well, you can't carry a lot on there, but... Uh, well, if you ever want to ride, you let me know. Oh, I'd be scared to do that. <laughs> Is it because of me driving or just because... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you guys got the chicken feed for me today, right? Yes, I do. So what's, what's all in the chicken feed? Uh, you have wheat in there, roasted beans, and corn, and then you've got all your minerals in it your oyster shells. And the soybeans are really, is that the highest protein in the yes, feed? Yes, it is. And how did you guys get started, Bob? Well, there was the, the need finding non-GMO grains, and we just went with the certified organic version, and then that seemed to become the normal eventually. Uh-huh. And you grow a lot of the corn and the crops here? Yeah. Or? We buy it from neighbors that are certified organic within maybe 25, 50 miles. That's great. That's wonderful that I know that my cows are really eating local. I think a lot of people would love yeah. to be able to eat within 50 miles of the, their house, but I'm glad that my cows and my chickens right. are able to do it. Well, good. Well, I'm going to grab my feed. Hey, you know, I was going to ask you guys, I'm having a little lunch today for a lot of the, the farmers in my community that have just done such an amazing job helping me and teaching me. And I think that you two are definitely on that list. I know that um, I come here, you know, once a week or once every two weeks. And I always, you know this, but Dan, I always come with a ton of questions because I feel like it's so important to talk to people who have more knowledge than me about what's what kind of things are happening on my farm and, and what are the, the, the problems I run into and you guys are so great about offering up uh, advice or, or uh, you know different things I could be doing and I think that's wonderful so I'd like to have you guys over for lunch. Thank you. Sure, we'll call. All right guys, I'll see you later. Okay. See ya, Yingo. Fill her up. All right, thank you. Oh, 
this is my neighbor's Tom's place. I can't. I think he's up here somewhere. I can't wait for you guys to meet him and his brother Steve. They're absolutely adorable. Hi, Tom. Hey, Inga. How are you today? Good. How's it going? It's cold. I know. Dang. This, we got what? some more rain, though. That's good. I know. But you know what they say is you wait 15 minutes and the weather changes. Yeah. So but I wore a sweatshirt all day today. <laughs> no, we've been castrating. And we get, every time it rains, we got a big manure event. So we got to yeah. clean all our lots. And so we've been at it. That's the whole thing. You yeah. know, sometimes I think about milking more cows. But then every time I, I talk to you, I think, well, maybe there's too much work. Yeah, it's a lot. Oh, but you got. Uh, but it's fun. I'm living my dream. Oh, that's good. That's yep. good. And you got you, you got your kids helping you out, so that's. Yeah, good. I got two boys. They both had to stay away from the farm for six years after they got done with school, and now they're back, and we're working with the university on this. What's the word? The transition. That transition. You're yeah. And I come up with one conclusion. What's that? If you want to do that, you should have zero kids. <laughs> yeah, it's going good, though. Yeah. I'm working, we got grandkids around. And yeah. What yeah. the whole thing? Yeah, it's fun. Well, how many acres are you running right now? We own 550. Wow. And, and that's... Then we rent some. And yeah. We feed it all up at home. Wow. We raise steers and yeah. milk about 100 cows. Wow. So how much time do you put into thinking about the feed for the cows? All the time. Yeah. But our cows eat better than we do. Cause yeah. We got a scale on our mixer and everything's balanced. And if we ate like that, we'd really be healthy. You know, you should just start drinking martinis. Yeah. I think that's better for you. I don't think you. so. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys really concentrate on uh, keeping um, keeping the environment healthy. and. and well, keeping, we do. Yeah? We do. I remember the first year I farmed. It was kind of organic up until then. Uh-huh. Put in crops for 43 years. Shoot. I only and thought you were 39, Tom. I was thinking when I was plowing, I was thinking when I get done farming here, there's going to be nothing left because of the erosion. Yeah. And we've gone no till and minimum till, and it's really worked good for us. We got good crops. Uh huh. Well, Tom, the reason I stopped you is I just, I'm having this little lunch today and I really want you to be a part of it because I'm inviting all the guys uh, in my community that have just helped me so much on my farm. And I know the first person I call when I get into an emergency with a cow is you. And I'm uh -huh. sorry that's because that's sometimes it's five o'clock in the morning, but <laughs> <laughs> you, you always seem to show up and help me out and, and just teach me uh, all these different things. And I really, I couldn't farm without uh -huh. you. It's, yeah. I'm going to go find your brother and invite him down too. So okay. uh, I'll let you get back to it. Okay. All right. Call some more manure. Hi, Steve. Hi. How are you doing? Well, I'm having a rough day today. My hired man didn't show up. Oh, I know how that goes. <laughs> well, hey, I wanted to have you over for lunch. I'll give you a hand uh, bail and hay if That'd you want to. That'd be great. All right. Let's go. Okay. So hay comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. Sometimes you can get uh, your big round bales, your big square bales, or your small square bales like this. I buy my hay in big squares. It works really well for me. They weigh somewhere around 700, 750 pounds depending on uh, what cutting it is. These weigh a lot less. I do try to keep a couple small bales handy around my farm just in case on those really cold days in the middle of February, if my skid steer doesn't start, I can still go up in the hayloft, throw down a few bales of hay and walk them over to the bale feeder. It just makes things a little bit easier and a little less stressful on those cold days. It's also nice to have small bales for the calves and the heifers. Ready. Well, that went pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, do you mind if I take this? I want to use it and sure. make lunch. So, all right. Make lunch? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a surprise. Don't, it's going to be okay. It's going to taste delicious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I'll see you down there. Yeah. So I wanted to have tastes of, of my pastures and, and my farm in this lunch that I'm going to prepare for these guys. So one thing I thought about was roasting the rosé veal, which I raise on the farm, with some of this beautiful meadow hay. I think it's going to give it an amazing flavor. It's going to be unique, and it's going to get these guys talking for a long time about having lunch at my house. <laughs> I'm so excited.
excited for this opportunity to cook for these amazing farmers. It's really the only way that I know how to give back for all that they've given to me by making them a farm fresh meal from ingredients right here at my farm. So for their dinner today, I'm gonna make them a roast veal and I'm gonna roast that veal in hay. And I thought it would be a nice way to add a little bit of herbal flavors. It's also an ancient way of cooking meat because it helps the moisture stay inside the meat. So I think they'll be a little bit surprised and maybe give them another idea of what they could do with their baled hay. The first thing I'm gonna do, season my veal with salt and pepper and a little bit of oil. Gotta get the oil on there first. And here we go. And I get pretty generous with the seasoning. Just rub that in a little bit so it stays. And this roast, I think it's just an arm roast. I just grabbed whatever I had down in the basement in the freezer. So I've got my Dutch oven cooking on high heat. I wanted the pan to be really, really hot before I put my veal in, because I want to get that nice crust, that nice brown crust all over on the veal. So I'm going to brown it on all sides. Okay, that's looking really good. Now I'm gonna put a bed of hay down and the hay has been soaked for a couple hours so that it's not gonna start on fire and it's just a beautiful grassy hay. So I'm gonna take about half of it, but it smells really good too. Set it right in there. And then I'll put some rosemary on top of that. And a few garlic cloves. Mix that around a bit. And then the roast goes right back in there. Oh, it looks so pretty. More hay on top. Now I'll just add my lid right to this. And that hay is gonna really help keep that moisture in there and it's gonna have this wonderful herbal flavors of my pastures. I'm kind of wondering if the guys are gonna be able to taste it a little bit. I think they are. I think they're gonna be excited about it. Well, I'll just pop this in the oven at 350 for about an hour or until it's done. And then why don't you guys meet me out in the garden and we can grab some ingredients for the rest of lunch. <laughs> As you can see, I'm not diligent about weeding my asparagus. Every spring without fail, the cows get out just as the asparagus emerges and they uh, just walk on through. So I always just take whatever they leave behind. They're so sweet to me. I wait all winter long for the first green nettles of the season. Okay, well now we're gonna get started on the next dish, which is gonna be a farro nettle and asparagus risotto. Doesn't that sound delicious? So the first thing I'm gonna do is chop up or slice up a shallot. Now these are a little bit tiny, so I might do two shallots. So just now put a little bit of oil in the pan. I got the pan over medium high heat. I'm gonna add my shallots and my garlic. Give those a stir around. Now, I don't know if this is a real risotto because I've never made a risotto. So I think I'm just gonna call this the St. Isidore's Faro made up recipe. I think we'll just go with that and see how it works. Saute up the shallots and the garlic. You'll start smelling it and the, they'll start sweating out and that's when you know they're ready for the other ingredients. Okay, so the next ingredient is the nettles, one of my favorite springtime and early summer ingredients to use here on the farm. Lucky for me, I've got it everywhere, so I like to use it as much as I can. It tastes really good, and if you're afraid of using it in a, a dish, don't be. It's really, really good, and I think it's a nice thing to surprise your guests with, too. I've got about four cups of loosely packed nettles here. I'll pop them in. And we're gonna cook those down. Now, if you don't wanna use nettles, you can use spinach, that's fine, but I think you should try it. When the nettles are cooked down, they're gonna be a little bit brighter green, but since they're so long, I'm gonna take them out of the pan and just chop them up a little bit. I'll take everything out of the pan here. And just do a rough chop on these. Now I've got my asparagus and I steamed it for just like two minutes just to get it a little bit soft. And I'm just gonna cut this on the diagonal because I think it looks pretty. Now I'm gonna add a little bit more oil back to the pan and we're gonna be on the way to a nice, wonderful treat here. Get 
that all over the place. I've got two cups of cooked farro here. Just follow whatever instructions are on the package, but cook it almost a little bit al dente because we're gonna continue cooking it here in our pan. So add that right in here. And I, you can make the farro up even a day ahead of time if you want to and have it cooled in the fridge so when you get ready to make this, you can just pop it right in. And I'm just gonna add right in here my nettles and my asparagus. Mix this all together, and I'm gonna start adding liquid now. So the first I'm gonna add about a cup of wine. And you're just gonna to have to keep, an, just eyeball the liquid, depending on what the farro you get is gonna absorb. So I'm just gonna cook this for, oh, I, like, you know, five, seven minutes or something until that liquid is absorbed, and then I'll add the vegetable broth. Now that the wine has absorbed into the farro, I'm gonna add a little bit of vegetable broth. If I was gonna eyeball it, I'd say about a half cup. Maybe a little bit less today. It seems like I don't need as much liquid. And then I'll just cook that down and let that absorb. Okay, next I'm gonna add a half stick of butter. Just one cube at a time. Well, I'm just gonna throw it all in. It's gonna melt fine. A couple at a time, how about that? Stir that in. That's gonna give it a nice creamy flavor. And it's gonna taste, I mean, butter makes everything taste great, so you're halfway there. Now that the butter's incorporated, I'm gonna add a very special ingredient. This is cheese that we make here on the farm. And it's another way of just letting these guys uh, have a feel for what we do here at St. Isidore's Mead. So this is a nice aged cheddar. I think it's been aged for, boy, almost a year. Uh, but you could use Parmesan or any hard cheese. It would be really lovely in this dish. I've got about a cup here. I'm just gonna add right to the pan. and just incorporate all this in, salt and pepper it, and it's ready to go right to the table. For dessert, I'm gonna let the eggs really shine in a lemon curd, and I'm gonna put the lemon curd in little tarts for the guys. When you're making a lemon curd, you really wanna find pastured eggs because that's what gives it that wonderful rich color is those great eggs. So make sure that you look for some pastured eggs or hopefully you have some in your backyard. So I've got the double boiler going on high, and I'm just gonna add six eggs to this right here, about a quarter cup of sugar, lemon juice, lemon zest, pinch of salt, and then we're gonna whisk away for about, oh, I don't know, eight to 10 minutes or something until it all comes together in a curd. We're doing this over a double broiler because I don't want the eggs to scramble. Now, if for some reason they scramble a bit, you can always just strain it out through a strainer and no one's gonna be the wiser, but try to just not burn your eggs because no one wants sugar scrambled eggs, right? Keep whisking constantly while you're doing this too. That's gonna help also make it a nice silky texture and not scrambled eggs. When the lemon curd reaches that custard consistency, take it off the heat and then add in a tablespoon of cold butter at a time up to about a stick of butter. Just in, keep incorporating the butter until all the butter is dissolved and it's nice and shiny. You can even chill it down for a little while before you put it in your tart shells. But I tell you what, I'm gonna get finished in the kitchen here and I'll meet you guys outside. It looks like everyone's starting to show up. These gentlemen are always willing to roll up their sleeves and lend a helping hand. Even when it comes to setting the table for lunch. Rosé veal roast, raised right here on the farm. Roasted in meadow hay from the back 40. That's what gives this roast a unique, herbal, and nutty flavor. The ancient grain farro, combined with cheddar and nettles, makes the perfect side dish for a hearty farm lunch. Crisp, cold, and bubbly cider from the Cider Farm in Mineral Point, Wisconsin. Whoa! <laughs> Crusty bread with lots of butter and a nice aged cheddar. That's what helps round out this early summer get together. The lemon curd tarts are tasty and a tangy way to end this very special thank you luncheon. Gather with us next time around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher.
Funding for Around the Farm Table is provided in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, a member-driven organization for family farmers, rural communities, and all people. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. Information at wisconsinfarmersunion.com with additional support from these community members and friends of Wisconsin Public Television.